Welcome. My name is Lily Weinberg, and I'm thrilled to have you join us on Coast to Coast. This is episode 17. It's hard to believe that we've been on this journey for uh, four months, um, looking really at the future of cities in context of COVID-19. Um, we've looked at all sorts of topics, from mobility to equity, um, with really an emphasis on public spaces and technology. Um, we're really thinking through what are the tangible, practical solutions that we can think through um, for our cities and for all of you um, who are in the audience today. Um, of course, um, for the parents out there, um, including myself, um, what we do with our kids is on the top of our minds. Um, I, I know I have a three-year-old who is in school and then his world um, turned literally upside down um, when all schools were shut down. Um, and so we're gonna be looking at what are some of the solutions that we're thinking about for schools and really making them safe. How can we leverage um, outdoor space during this time? So I'll examine um, how schools can leverage green space during COVID-19, and we'll take a look at how parks and public spaces can provide a safer space for outdoor learning. Um, and we have a leading expert on this. So I want to welcome Sharon Dinks, the CEO and founder of Green Schoolyards America, a nonprofit that supports schools in using their outdoor areas more strategically to improve the well-being of children, their communities, and the urban environment. So hey, Sharon, how's it going? Hi, thanks so much for having me today. I'm, I'm thrilled to have you. Thank you for being here. I know all of the parents out there are, are eager to learn more about what you have to say um, about schools and, and green spaces. So, so thanks again um, for joining us. And um, what I really also think is, is very, very interesting about Green Schoolyards America um, is that you guys are the co-founder of the National COVID-19 Outdoor Learning Ishi Initiative, um, which is helping school districts across the country use outdoor spaces as they reopen with physical distancing measures in place. So, so that's gonna be um, a big bulk of what we're talking about um, today. Um, so for our audience members out there, um, so the way this is gonna work um, for, for you, um, Sharon and, and me, is we're gonna have about 15 minutes uh, for an interview. Um, we'll go through a few questions around um, what you're doing um, now, how you're responding um, in context of COVID-19 and really kind of looking at the future um, uh, you know, after, because hopefully COVID will end, right? Um, and, and there will be a future to, to all of this. Um, so we'll have 15 minutes of that. And then we'll have time for our audience members um, to put in their questions um, in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen um, or on Facebook or Twitter, hashtag Night Live. Um, so we'll have about 10-ish you know, minutes to, to take uh, live questions um, together. So with that, um, Sharon, um, let's, let's get started. Um, so I would love to start with um, some context setting. Um, you know, for you to tell us a bit about your work with Green Schoolyards America and why you started this work. Um, I know you've been personally um, involved with this for, for over 20 years and Green Schoolyards has been, um, you guys have been at this for about seven years. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing and, and your, your, your theory of change. Sure, thanks. 
Um, I've been I've been in the green schoolyard field for 20 years. Originally started in, in grad school, looking at the question of how do we make green cities. Um, and it seemed to me that that it wasn't a technical problem. We know how to make cities that that are good for um, the ecosystems, but it's a consensus problem. And so I've been working on trying to solve the consensus problem of green cities. I'd say for the last 20 years, as someone with an urban planning background. Um, and, and I also have been intersecting that with how do we make great spaces for children um, in my work in general. And <clears throat> to me, a green schoolyard is a place that um, is a microcosm of the green city that you'd like to see. So it's a place where you can demonstrate how, where the rain should go when it falls, how it comes off the, the rooftops and goes down the downspouts and soaks into the ground, um, how you can <clears throat> plant trees to change the microclimate um, of your neighborhood and also directly protect kids from heat, um, how you can add wildlife habitat for the birds and butterflies coming through and grow food for, with agriculture and then also involve kids and teachers and the community in the democratic processes that are um, that we'd like to see around how shared public space gets governed and decisions made for that. So for me, <clears throat> it's always been about, about that um, shifting a schoolyard into the place that you want to model what you want to see in the, in the environment. And um, about seven years ago, after designing green schoolyards and working on participatory design um, in many schools, I decided to found a nonprofit, Green Schoolyards America, to work at city scale change and to work with school districts and ask them the larger questions that would, I hope, change the norm for, for what we think of as a traditional school ground. How do we turn all of our school grounds into more park-like spaces that have benefits for children's learning and health and ecological systems um, and community access to public open space? And so we work with school districts and we ask them, you know, what do you want the hundreds of acres that you manage to do for your kids and your community? How do you want it to be resources for education? How do you want it to help mental and physical health and and the ecosystems. Um, and, and we're thinking about this too on the larger scale and the state scale where we live. For example, in California, we have 10,000 schools and they are collectively on 130,000 acres of land with a daily user rate of 6.2 million kids and several hundred thousand adults. And so that makes it some of our most heavily used public land, a public park space, but we're not investing in it as if it matters and as if it is the most valuable space. So, so that's the frame we bring to this. We start from, from the kind of land base of it and add and ask what we want from our shared public space and how we can act together to make it better. I, I, what, what's so interesting about this is that I'm, schools, what you said is, is so powerful because schools take up so much of the land within our cities, but we don't think about that land as part of kind of the, the, the bigger picture of our, you know, public space. Um, and so this is really an, an interesting holistic look that I, I don't think is necessarily new. My understanding is in Scandinavia, um, many countries are looking at it more holistically that, that this is all part of the, you know, public land and, and, and um, in their country. But in the United States, that's not necessarily a common practice is my understanding, right? Right, right. And, and um, I also um, co-founded an organization called the International School Grounds Alliance. And so we meet with colleagues from Europe and Asia and elsewhere and look at how they use land. And we're trying to essentially with Green School Yards America here, trying mm. to look at which of those ideas would fit in our context that mm. have been are tried and true and that have resulted in large scale shifts that are really positive for kids and the environment. And so we look to Berlin, Germany, for example, where 25 years ago they made a law that every um, every school property, and I think every parcel, has to absorb all of the rain that falls on wow. that parcel. And with that one public policy change, uh, 400 schools almost completely un unpaved about 20, 25 years ago. And now they have uh, what they call sponge schoolyards, which, have, which absorb all of their stormwater and which have forests where on all the school grounds. And so you have kind of the wow. idea set up for climate resilience and um, nurturing children in park-like spaces. And so that's yeah. what we're trying to model. We know it works. It's been done. It's been done decades ago. Yeah. Um, we're slow <laughs> to join. Yeah.
Right. And, and so I want to also link to your book, Asphalt to Ecosystems, um, which also will goes in, you know, more in depth in, in the concepts that you're talking about. Um, and, and, but, but a couple of things, it's a win for children, right? But it's also a win for cities um, yeah. from, from what I'm hearing. It, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a micro, it's, it's starting with the schools and it's a, it's a micro ecosystem of, of what you want your cities to be, um, which makes perfect sense. Um, so, so thanks for that, that setup and that context setting um, uh, for, for what you do, the really important work. And what I, I want to now talk about this crazy moment in time that we're in um, with, with um, in the middle of a pandemic and uh, with COVID-19 and the work that, that you've done um, has become incredibly relevant during COVID-19. And so, so can you tell us um, why, why is it relevant um, and, and how your organization um, is, is responding? Sure, um, yeah, this time has been, uh, as we all know, just, just an incredibly challenging one. And from a school perspective, it's, it's really hard for schools to reopen with physical distancing measures in place. Mm -hmm. because our buildings just weren't built to have enough space inside for kids six feet apart to fit them in the classroom. And they weren't built with ventilation systems capable of filtering a pandemic from the air. So mm -hmm. we have space problems and air quality problems inside our buildings. And we also have, <clears throat> um, we know that kids during this time are, are experiencing trauma in their lives from separation from one another, from watching family members or friends be ill. Um, during the pandemic. So they're gonna be returning to school with a lot of mental health um, problems and also adults also are feeling that stress. And so bringing them outside, not only has more space and better air quality, but also the therapeutic value of landscape um, is right there. We know that, that trees and nature calm our nervous systems and help us reduce stress and be able to focus better. And so we, we see that as a positive um, for going outside as well. Um, and um, it's also, being online has also caused and exacerbated inequalities, existing inequalities in our yeah. system. And it's vitally important that we bring as many kids back, um, particularly the most vulnerable, as soon as possible so that they can have caring, nurturing, um, stable environments at school with adults who, who they can, um, who will support them in, in all ways. And so, so bringing kids back, um, and not everyone has been able to access Wi-Fi equally or access the computers equally. And so that we've seen massive learning loss. Um, so returning to school is a priority, but doing so in a way that is healthy and within health guidance um, is very important. So to meet that need and to address those concerns, um, we, we collaborated with uh, four other, three other partners, the Lawrence mm -hmm. Hall of Science, which is a science museum, 10 Strands, which is a nonprofit, um, and uh, San Mateo County Office of Education to create something called the National COVID-19 Outdoor Learning Initiative, um, which supports schools and districts around the country and their efforts to reopen safely and equitably uh, using outdoor spaces as strategic cost-effective tools that mm -hmm. can maximize the number of kids who can safely return to campus with physical distancing. And we, we've been building this initiative over the last um, two and a half, three months let's say three months, uh, and we're joined now by about 15 other organizations and hundreds of volunteers. Wow. They're helping us uh, write an online free how-to manual. So if a school or district wants to be able to um, say, says, yes, this is a good idea, I wanna mm -hmm. take our kids outside to, to solve those problems we're talking about, um, how do we do it? And we wanna have the answers to how do you do it on our website, and we are, it's not gonna be one giant manual that's downloadable as a book. It's more of a, a series of frequently asked question answers that are set out in, um, to explain to different uh, communities or, and different people within the educational systems how, how this might work. And we have some of the pieces already online. Um, the site planning pieces, for example, that will help a principal work with their teachers to walk their site and see where classes could physically sit and think about what the materials would be that they would use and what it might cost and run through some of the logistics to figure out how they can go outside. There's lots of other pieces of, um, of the manual coming soon and we're, we know that schools don't have very, schools have very different types of landscapes. And so we're also thinking about if you don't have enough space on your own school ground, how might you go to a local park or mm. close a street like we're doing for restaurants in so many cities to have space outside. Um, and we're also seeing this as, as a potential new plan A, for example. Mm. So 
um, schools right now, their first plan is to go online or to go inside. And so we're saying in general, what if your, your plan A could be going outside and staying outside whenever conditions were right for your school to be outside and then coming in, going to the backup plan of online or inside when you need to. And so for some schools that um, those conditions shift with the weather. And mm -hmm. so if it's too hot in the fall in Southern California, you might wait until it cools off. If it's too cold um, in the Northeast in the winter, you might come in when it gets really cold. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so we're, we're helping, helping think through some of the logistics around what would make it easier to stay out for plan A longer, like adding tents or making sure every kid has the right clothing to be outside. Right, right. Uh, and I love that, that this is the, this is the plan A that you're thinking about. You, you said a, a few things that, that you guys have built a toolkit um, for schools to, to be able to navigate this um, new territory. So I'm, I, we're going to link to the National COVID-19 Outdoor Learning Initiative, where, where it has all of the toolkit and all the information um, around this. So for our audience members to access it. Um, and um, and, and, and you, you said something interesting around, around the weather because I think that that's that's probably a, a pushback that that many folks have um, whether it's it's too hot or too cold and and when we had a chat um, before this I said well you know Sharon I have a bunch of communities in the Dakotas how are they going to do this and um, and you talked a little bit about um, the working groups and the regions and you told me a little bit about a working group from Vermont and Maine and how they're thinking about it could you, could you share a little bit about about that and and how they were thinking thinking about, you know, the, the, the outdoor learning. Sure. So we've had 10 working groups um, yeah. working on this, on various aspects of these questions for the last couple of months. And one of them is the outdoor infrastructure working group, which has been focusing on um, questions of, about weather and where we will put our weather um, based answer document online or idea document really um, online yeah. in the next couple of weeks. Uh, <laughs> it's almost finished. And, and I think it's, um, I think that, that, Responses to weather are very um, cultural, more than than driven by the actual temperature. Um, mm. The schools in the Northeast tell us they're comfortable being outside, many of them, until 10 degrees. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Miami, so that sounds yeah. crazy. But exactly. And so in Florida, people might think it's cold. Uh, when I've been in Florida, people have told me it's cold at 50, right? And yes. If we come inside, it's too cold for recess, sometimes at 35, 40. So yeah. I think it's relative, and that's okay. We're yeah. just trying to help, help people be comfortable where they are. I think it's, it's more, focus more on, on the idea of, of adults can relate to the concept of outdoor dining. Um, yeah. and wanting to be outside and, and those picnic tables with the umbrellas and sitting outside in a comfortable place. And so how do we extend the comfort in the restaurant context when the adults are dining? We put up shade umbrellas, we pull out heaters if we need to when it's a little cold. Um, and some of those, of course, need to be checked to meet safety standards for children, which are different right. than adults. But the idea is generally the same. How do you, you feel more comfortable outside when everyone has a warm enough coat and rain boots if it's raining? There are these fabulous head-to-toe jumpsuits for rain that forest schools, even up in the north, um, use to be to have their kids outside all, all day, even when it's damp, the kids enjoy it. But yeah. you know, the idea is to, is to make people comfortable. So if that involves right. a tent, put up a tent. Um, if it, yeah, so th there's many solutions. And I think um, we will be outlining those and describing what they are in this document. Right. And, and so for folks who want to look more at the, the working groups, um, we're also going to link to specifically those working groups. Um, and, and so and, and you talked a little bit about, you know, whether it's a tent or whatever, you know, this doesn't have to be incredibly fancy what outdoor learning um, looks like. So, so I would like to ask for us to flash up. Um, we have a couple of pictures of, of what this could look like um, for, uh, were these pilots, Sharon, or, or prototypes of, of what the outdoor learning could look like? Or is this an actual example? Um, this is an actual example from a school called Golestan Education in El Cerrito, California, where they had a, a running, they were running a summer program and they built outdoor classroom spaces to, to run their summer program. And they had a, a COVID a health protocol that they used that kept everyone healthy all summer. And they've just yeah. reopened um, with a waiver from the health department to, because their, their protocol meets code. For the, for the fall. So they're now in session as well using this space, although it's transformed to now have a, a bigger, more, a bigger tent over it. Amazing. But it, but it's not, it's not fancy, but it does the job, right? Um, yeah. And then the, here's another example that, that we pulled. Um, can you tell us about this one? 
here it's the same school and this is an example of um, we, we're recommending that schools look first to what they already have before they buy anything new. And so these were desks that were literally in the school's basement that weren't, they were in storage, they weren't being used. And so they pulled them out and, mm -hmm. and made them their outdoor learning um, stations. And they just added a tent so that it would stay out of the sun and, and out of a, a light drizzle. Um, and so that's, that's what they use also in the summer, same school. Oh, great. Great. Um, so, so with this, um, before we, we take some questions from the audience, I, I want to, I want to ask you, um, what do you, you know, obviously this is a, this is a stressful time for all of us, um, with, with COVID and, um, but, but with, um, crisis, um, brings opportunity. And I think the fact that we're all talking about this, the fact that so many schools that you're, you're leading the way, you know, to are, are thinking about how do we leverage the outdoors? What do you think is potentially the opportunity um, uh, for the future of how we think about, um, you know, schools and, and outdoor spaces um, in our cities? Well, it's been really exciting to see um, schools and districts try outdoor learning for the first time. We've been, one of our working groups I didn't mention earlier was, is a group that's a community of practice for early adopter schools and districts who are, we're waiting for the manual to come out, who are diving right in and, and making plans and are, some of them already have opened outside. And so I think what, what we've seen from that experience is that some schools that had never tried outdoor learning are considering this to be a, an option to go to scale with right now. And we hope that once they're out there that they'll be find themselves really comfortable in this environment. And, and just as when we move restaurant dining outside, we find ourselves mm -hmm. really comfortable out there and we say, why did we sit inside all the time when there's all this nice, um, it's nice to be outside. So we hope that a lot of schools will see that. We hope that they will um, also see that there are hands-on learning resources all around them if you go outside. Yeah. And uh, if it's a school's first time outside, they'll probably take their indoor curriculum out, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. But when you've been out there for longer, you can start to build on and add to the resources you have in your, in your teaching toolbox by using the environment as, as something to learn from as well as in. Mm. Yeah, and I wonder, Sharon, too, if there's an opportunity for us to just be reimagining the relationship that we have between parks and, and schools, too. Um, you know, you said that that now some schools are potentially leveraging, you know, um, uh, Parks and Rec um, during this time, too. So we'll see. Definitely. And one of our working groups is working on the topic specifically about how to best set up relationships between school districts and park systems and the mm. city who might be able to open the sidewalk or go close streets temporarily like they're doing in New York, New York City right now as they plan to scale up. Um, and so we're trying to help make that easier. Schools and parks haven't traditionally in the United States been part of the same planning unit as they are in Europe, where it's just a little easier to, to plan together. But they are both public, public lands for public benefits, and it would be wonderful to see them weaving their goals together and collaborating more in the future as well. Mm, mm, absolutely, especially in our, in our denser communities. Okay, great. So let's, let's take some questions that we have from the audience. Um, so, so the first one that I see um, is around a, a question around engagement. So how engaged have families and their students been willing to be? And what have been some best practices in engaging with, with the families um, during this time? Um, we have another working group working on community yeah. engagement recommendations, yeah. and those will be online shortly. Um, we're, yeah. We are recommending that the communities be involved in the decision making that the schools are, are going through right now. And I think parents uh, are super involved um, as mm -hmm. our teachers in responses to COVID. Everyone wants to keep um, everyone else, they want to keep themselves and everyone else healthy and safe. And so I think that's been the priority. It's been kind of a triage moment of mm -hmm. you know, how do we do this? and um, and it's, it's uh, easy to overlook all the people who should be involved in that conversation, but we, we definitely think that all, all people who are affected, parents, students, teachers, principals, should be asked what they want for their school and be part of the conversation to craft the solution that they'd like. Mm, absolutely. And so, so there's a question, um, kind of a follow up around this um, for, for schools that maybe aren't on board for, for outdoor learning. Um, uh, are, are there any um, techniques um, or, you know, part of the toolkit that can help um, persuade them perhaps to, to get on board? 
Yeah, I think that there are, I mean, you can come outside. It's beneficial to be outside as much as possible. So yeah. that could be during class time, but it also could be at lunch or if the school serves breakfast. And those are times of days when all the kids and all the adults who are eating will have their masks off. So what mm -hmm. better time to be outside where the air is fresh and the breeze is blowing um, and transmission rates are much lower. So just having meals outside is important. Mm -hmm. Having PE outside, potentially having music outside if you can space um, kids apart, having art or a library outside, mm -hmm. um, things like that. We spoke with one librarian who had designed a whole outdoor library program because she knew that she was going to be asked to see 500 kids at her school and wanted to make sure that they were um, not all coming through an indoor space where she was. And so she mm. created an outdoor library program. So it's, it's not just the classrooms. Um, definitely any specialty programs um, benefit from being outside. So the more of the day that can be out the better. Absolutely. So, so one of the things that you said um, was was around dressing appropriately, right? Um, and uh, especially as you know, weather weather is going to be changing. Um, and and um, so there's a question kind of around the equity piece of that. Um, and and so you know, how how can we ensure that that children have the proper clothes to be able to um, you know withstand the, 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 the cold weather, um, you know, uh, for, for outdoor learning. Have you, have you guys put any thought into that? Yes. Um, we think that the clothing should be considered part of the infrastructure for mm -hmm. outdoor classrooms and that it should be budgeted for along with the tents and seating, um, that it is something that, um, that, that every child needs. And so there could be, a, schools could handle that differently to assess how many of what they need to buy um, for clothing, but we think that they should check and make sure that every child has warm enough clothes and either talk to um, retailers who might be able to give them bulk purchases of new items or some, we've heard at least one district talking about trying to source um, high quality used clothing to, to be able to hand it out for free as well because they didn't have a budget for, for it yet. Um, but we think that it's central to be able to, to do it. And the best way to do that is to think of it as infrastructure for being outside. Um, it's part of the gear that's needed. And so it should be provided by the same um, centralized school uh, processes that are building outdoor classrooms. Absolutely. I, I love that. It's part of the infrastructure. It is just, just part of what has to be done. Um, when I was in, um, when I was in Copenhagen, um, Sharon, I think we, I told you this before, but um, you know, when, when they had bad weather they they well when i when i claimed there was bad weather they said no 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 there's no such thing as bad weather there's just bad clothes um and you know that we all that you just have to be prepared um and but making sure that our children are protected is, is critical so it's, it seems like you're absolutely thinking about that so there's a question um around um and you you highlighted this about the budgeting piece and and you know that you put this in the budget but but of course you know schools are um are you know uh, don't have as as much resources as they've had before. Many are are really stressed actually financially. And so so how how what part of the school budget are you recommending that we pull these funds for to implement these ideas, um, you know, around the outdoor learning? Have you guys thought about that? Yeah, I think that that budgets follow priorities, mm -hmm. um, and it's a question of making this a priority. We when when everyone thought that Plan A should be online learning, there funds came out of the woodwork to buy computers. Um, mm -hmm. and, and also the, the um, indoor, you know, indoor screens, like pieces of plexiglass are going in everywhere. That money is coming from, it is because schools are focusing on indoors as a priority. It exists. Um, mm -hmm. so, and, and we imagine that that can be shifted when you say our priority is to be outside. The same resources that fed those, those um, pieces of the budget could potentially feed outdoor learning. We have heard some school districts are using CARES Act funds to build mm. outdoor classrooms as they would to, to shift indoor classrooms. We've heard others doing fundraisers around, um, around their programs, but I think that we need to put it in the same category as providing the infrastructure to go online or providing the infrastructure to be safe inside and thinking about um, you know, what are the costs to society if we can't get our kids back in a safe way, all those parents who are out there Trying to trying to work with kids at home or or who's you know equity wise who, kids who can't access any school unless they come back and if inside doesn't have enough space and not and 
not enough air quality, uh, not good enough air quality, then we, you know, we can't shift that piece of the economy uh, forward. And, um, and so I, I think it just should be a priority and should be prioritized in the budget space. Absolutely. It's, it, it is what you said earlier, and we have to wrap up, but the, the time flew by. Um, but, but this is about being plan A, right? Yeah. This is plan A, and this is the priority. Um, we're in a crisis, and, and we have to you know, figure out how to make sure this is a priority within our communities and how this is a priority for our kids. Um, and, and so with that, um, Sharon, um, thank you so much for talking with us um, about how we can leverage um, uh, green spaces um, for our schools um, during this very, very dynamic time during the pandemic. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your leadership. Um, um, during this time and how you are working with hundreds and hundreds of schools across the country. Um, there were a bunch of questions um, in the chat around looking at pictures, um, finding out more information. Um, for everyone who wants to have more information, we linked everything into the chat box um, below in the Zoom webinar. Um, and, and so you can have access and it's really, really easy um, to, to go on um, Green Schoolyard's website and, and everything is, is on there around the COVID response um, where you can get more involved and where you can learn practically around how to do this in your community. Um, good luck, Sharon, um, with your work and, um, and, and thank you for, for sharing this, this very, very valuable information. Um, for our viewers out there, um, next week we are going to have Gabe Klein um, on our show and we'll be talking about the future of um, budgeting and how cities can really look at their budget and during um, this really uh, difficult dynamic time. Um, and, and so with that, uh, see you next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Take care.